Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm Simon, he's Dan. Um, usually the first question we get, is it Picus or Picus? And we say Picus, so, but you can say what you like. Yeah, and the next question usually is, is what is breach and attack simulation or what is it we do? So the, the whole idea behind what, it, what we do is we want to validate your security controls are working as you expect them to. And then we want to highlight the gaps uh, where those security controls are and hopefully provide you with some remediation. Um, I come from the sock and sim space, so I spent, instead of doing the cool stuff in hoodies, hacking stuff, I spent like my time wearing glasses and looking at log files and stuff, trying to get data into a sim. Uh, so I come at it from that sort of side, side of the house, and there's some things in, this, in the Pickers platform which I think sort of really help with what Tao was saying about the foundations, because she's absolutely right. The, bits that, the bit that's going to bite you in the backside is, is the foundational pieces that you've forgotten. You've been distracted by ML or UBA or whatever the latest widget is, and all of a sudden someone spun up five servers, they put them in your data center, they're not logging into your SIM, so you've got no visibility, and so you've got a massive blind spot in your environment. So um, that, that, that's kind of sort of my view of it. And so this is, this is what we're trying to, um, these, these are the types of problems we're trying to address with, with Pickers. Um, we've got a few products in the technology stack, but the thing we're going to look at today is our security control validation platform, which Gartner would call breach and attack simulation. Um, so this is where we're trying to emulate and simulate uh, real-world adverse ad, ad malicious behavior in our environment uh, to see how the controls stand up. So um, I'm going to do like a short 90-minute demo um, just before lunch, and then Dan's going to finish off with another two-hour lecture. So uh, I'm, sure it will, I'm sure it will fly by, no worries. So um, this is the, the Pickers dashboard, um, uh, and this is what you see when you first log into the security control validation platform. So we break everything down into prevention and detection scores, so we want to know how well we're stopping stuff and how well we're seeing stuff effectively. Um, and what we can say about this environment is, is we're currently preventing 48% of the attacks that are being simulated, and we're detecting 66% of them. So not bad, but not great. Um, we deliver everything like this in a 0 to 100% score, so it's really easy to, to communicate to non-technical people or just communicate around to other people actually makes it very easy. Uh, and we color coordinate as well in case percentages are confusing for some people. Although if you get confused by percentages and you're color blind, I, I guess we're pretty stuck. Um, okay, so we've got some work to do, and that's kind of a high-level snapshot of how we're doing right now. One of the things I like about breach and attack simulation, and I think all of the tools, including um, uh, Gitpole um, and you know, services like eCentire and, and, and everything, is really we want to add more context and data into conversations. We don't want people to be reacting or knee-jerk reacting to things because you make bad decisions. People are bad at making decisions under pressure. Uh, and so as we sort of move through the dashboard and through, through the, the demo I'm going to go through, hopefully you'll sort of see how we're sort of layering in that context. So the first part is our security score graph. This is how well we've been doing over time. Now this is our demo environment, which is non-operational, which is why that graph looks almost perfectly flat. Uh, what tends to happen uh, when you use a product like Picus is that where you start to mitigate your environment based on the advice you get from the platform, your, your, uh, your environment evolves as our platform evolves. Our platform evolves with the threat landscape, so it's a kind of a knock-on effect. So what we tend to see is that graph trending upwards or staying somewhere near the top. However, you will get these little notches in the graph every now and again. That tends to be because we're either simulating a new threat that's, that's maybe in a zero day or something like that, a new thing that your controls haven't seen before, or it could be a policy configuration error. So we were talking quite a lot about Active Directory, and I'm pretty old school these days, uh, so I think about things in terms of group policy objects. But you know, I've worked in organizations before where a user said, I can't get to this shared drive or I can't get to that thing can you just sort us out some access or whatever? And they'll raise a ticket, the operational guy will, will make the change in Active Directory, but unbeknownst to them, there's a knock-on security effect that they haven't necessarily considered because not everybody's you know, thinking about security all the time. And so we'll surface that up here. The platform itself is broken down into modules. Um, we used to have a, uh, our old platform was just like, you just bought the one thing, but we'd, customers kept on feeding back to us that they were interested in specific use cases or they wanted to try different things, different combinations of things. So we broke it out into modules, and that's what we're looking at at the moment on screen. Um, we try to overlay everything we can do to, uh, to a kill chain. So we've got delivery on the left, and we right the way through to exfiltration on the right-hand side. There's a couple of different ways that I think that you can use this data. And one's kind of straightforward and transactional. So our network infiltration attacks relates to our perimeter firewalls. So our perimeter firewalls aren't really stopping much from coming in. 
So, okay, let's have a look at that. Let's have a look at the data. What have we got to do to remediate that? Maybe we've got to load some signatures into our IPS module or something like that. And it's a very transactional, let's raise a change and, and fix that problem. If we consider the old trusty Windows endpoint um, where we've got a score of 62%, as a security professional, we could say, okay, well, look, 62% is, is too low of a score. We're not happy with that. We need to raise, raise our game a little bit here. And the business can either agree with you or not agree with you. But they've got data. They're making decisions now with, with data. And we can provide evidence of, of what it is we've, we've managed to exploit in the environment. The best part about this, though, I think, really, is that once you've made that change where you've run that initiative, when you get to the end of that project, you can rerun a baseline score against that endpoint and then compare the deltas. So you started off at 62%, and we might have ended up at 95%. I'm not going to try and do the maths. Uh, and so for X amount of investment, you've got Y improvement in your security score. So it really does start to help you understand your return on investment. And it also helps guide where you need investment in your, in your environment. And another really good use case, actually, uh, we have with some customers is they'll, if they're, they're talking to another vendor or they're going through another proof of concept, they'll use our product to A-B test. So if you're testing CrowdStrike and Defender ATP, you could A-B test it with our product to see which one's better out of the box or, or, or whatever. Um, Below that, we've got, this is a new feature that came out a couple of weeks ago. So we've added some benchmarking, so in-region benchmarking and in industry vertical benchmarking based on our own users. Um, and one of the things we're able to do with that data is to say, this is what your peers in your region or this is what your peers in your industry vertical, these are the things that they're concerned about. And it helps with idea generation. Because sometimes you put a, like a, someone's talking about, uh, having a like a, a, a being gifted a toolbox, and if you don't know what to do with the tools, they're useless to you, right? And so, if you've got all of this uh, capability in front of you, if you don't know what to do with it, or you've got not running out of ideas, uh, it can be difficult to where, know where to get started. So this is the first place you can see that. Um, one of the things that we do, um, which I think is very very cool, so I'm a big fan of the Mitre Attack framework, but one of the things with the framework is that. Um, I think it's quite difficult for organizations sometimes to operationalize that framework. And we were talking about standards earlier. I used to work with a guy who actually said compliance is one step away from negligence. You should start, you should start off with a good security posture, but that's another conversation. Uh, so one of the things that we're trying to do here in terms of operationalizing the framework is to say, okay, well, let's run some simulations and see how well you're doing against the TCPs that you're worried about. And we read amber green that status. So this WMI TCP here, you can see the attacker actions that have happened. We can see whether the actions were blocked or not blocked. We can see whether we logged any data in our seam. And we can also see whether our seam alerted based on that. And we can dive into that and see a bit more information around the attack timeline. Uh, we can see the payload that we used, the terminal output. So it's pretty transparent like that. We can even see the log data. So this is putting back log data from our Splunk instance. So the endpoints created the log data. It's sent back to Splunk. And then we've made an API call to pull, pull it back. And we do the same thing with the alert. So really, really useful information. There's another thing as well that I'll, I'll show you in the detection side, but I want to come into that later. Uh, if there's a TTP in here that you think, OK, actually, we've done our threat profiling, and we do want to know how our environment's done, but we've not run any simulations on that, we can click on the card, and we could hit this Simulate Now button, and the, and the platform's going to go and build us a template around that TTP or something that features that TTP, and we can simulate that in our environment. So it really is that easy to get going with it. Um, OK, so that's kind of the sort of dashboard and the output of the platform. We'll have a look at, um, we sort of segued into how to run stuff. So everything in the platform is done via templates. Um, this is our emerging threats templates. This is stuff that's recommended by our Pickers Labs team. So our, our labs team, red teamers, blue teamers, um, they're probably doing the same thing that a lot of you guys are doing. They'll subscribe to threat intelligence feeds. They'll do their own research, look at news events, that type of stuff. Uh, once they find uh, a threat, they'll reverse engineer it. The red team will reverse engineer it, capture the signatures, and they hand it over to the blue team. And the blue team build the detection content around it. And we surface it up there um, in these templates. To run a template, we just click on a template, hit Simulate Now, find an agent. Uh, sometimes there's some extra config. And then we can just hit the Simulate Now button. And that's going to go away and build that template. So the, the cloud instance, sorry. The agent has checked in with the cloud to say, have I got any simulations to run, yes or no? You have. So then the playbook starts to, then the agent downloads the playbook and it starts to run the playbook. And we can come back and have a look at that in a second. Some customers want to um, build their own threats. And we can do that in a, a number of different ways. So uh, we could just jump straight into our threat library. And, and sort of point of clarification, a, a threat for us is every single line you see on, on, on the, on the uh, screen there is a threat. 
and then each threat has individual attacker actions underneath it. So if we wanted to build something around, uh, let's say, Black Cat, they always come up with really cool names for threats, or maybe not Black Cat, but um, anyway, so if we wanted to do Black Cat, we could do that, just hit the boxes and, and go through the same soon in now process if we wanted to, or we could say, okay, I know I'm particularly worried about APC28, so we can build a search around particular threat groups. Uh, we can cut it up any which way you want to do it. And we can build these into our own custom templates that we can either run in an ad hoc manner or we can schedule them to run regularly or continuously. Uh, and then the last way we can run threats is where you really start to leverage our threat database. So we could build a custom, uh, custom kill chain uh, for a Windows machine. And this is where we're starting to leverage uh, the individual exploits from our threat database um, in your own attack. So here we're just going to filter on initial access and we can just start to drag them across and we can start to build out the kill chain that way. And for anybody that does any offensive work in-house, has their own red teamers or pen testers, that type of stuff, we can create our own custom actions. This is where you get to upload your own tools, your own scripts, anything that can be executed at the box, you can load up into this platform. It was an interesting use case came out the other day, actually. I was chatting to a guy, and he, he wanted to load up some verification scripts, because at the end of the day, we're just executing something at the command line and capturing the output. And so he wanted to, uh, I think they were, they were NIST, scripts or something like that to verify the NIST config was in place. Um, so he sort of saw it that way. Other pen testers I talked to talk about how they can automate the beginning part of their pen testing activity by leveraging this tool. Uh, not all pen testing activity lends itself too well to automation because you need that, that human ingenuity. Um, but we can automate quite a lot of it. Uh, I'm moving through this at a rapid pace. It's like I'm doing an auction. Um, Okay, so we've looked, at, we've looked at the output, we've looked at how we run stuff. Uh, if we have a look at a simulation result now, I think our simulation is still running. So we'll pick on uh, black, white ransomware. So this is a template that we run every day, um, and I use it for demoing purposes. Um, a lot of people still want to talk to us about ransomware, which is, um, you know, it's been around for a long, long time, and we've never really sort of solved the problem or come up with a good idea to solve the, Well, there's many good ideas to solve the problem, but I don't think we've cracked it. Um, and so I, I tend to talk about this, it's quite relevant for people. So the arc of this attack really is, is we're going to try and deliver something via email, then we're going to try and download some command and control, and then we're going to try and see what we're going to exploit, exploit on the endpoint itself. So we're pretty poor at blocking uh, the emails in this environment, so we send two emails, one with an attachment and one with a malicious URL, and we can see that this UR URL has made it past our, our mail gateway. Um, there's a bit of a biblical debate in the BAS community in terms of do you simulate or emulate? Uh, and what I mean by that is do you use benign payloads or do you use real payloads? We use real payloads because otherwise it's the equivalent of testing your kit against an iCar file uh, for, for AV, if people know, people know what that is. But what we're able to do, because we use the real stuff, is provide real checksum information. So if you're using Mimecast or Proofpoint or something like that, you can build signature information using this checksum information very, very quickly. Um, and we also provide uh, what we call generic mitigation. So this is like technology-based best practices. So don't allow URLs in emails or maybe use some sort of e URL rewriting technology or something like that. Okay, so our environment, the emails got through, uh, all of them got through. So let's check our perimeter file where we can see that actually we've got an RTF variant and we've got uh, an XE variant that has made it through. So let's have a look at the RTF file. So these two attacks are, are very similar in terms of we're trying to deliver a payload to something inside the customer's environment to see whether that control stops it. Um, the first one was obviously the mail gateway. This is the firewall. So the attack details page looks exactly the same. We're able to start getting into logging information so we can see actually in QRadar we've got some checkpoint logs that relate to this, uh, this delivery. When it comes to prevention, this is where we start to really help our customers mitigate advice, right? So if you're running checkpoint firewalls and this was the result in your environment, this is the checkpoint signature you'd need to load into the IPS module to block this from happening. So we can very, very quickly say, if you're running these firewalls and you baseline your firewalls with our tool, this is the list of signatures today that you need to load into your IPS module to close the gap. Um, and there's obviously the other host there. So really, really cool stuff. And, and that's how we can take that 30% score or whatever, whatever it was at the beginning. We can raise that up quite quickly. Uh, where it gets more interesting for me on the endpoint side of things um, is uh, when we start to talk about the logging stuff again. So there is always going to be things in your environment that you cannot prevent from happening. And they are a lot of them are where attackers will use tools that are enabled in the, in the OS 
Um, they're available for them to use, things like IP config or printing root tables, or in this case, we're gathering system languages via PowerShell. So this is a really benign PowerShell command. Do I want my sock kicking into action when this goes off? Absolutely not. But taken in context of the whole attack, you can then infer that something malicious is going on, right? So get, get, this, is the, this is the PowerShell command. So if the user got access to PowerShell, they can run it. This is the output, so it's not very, not very bad. Uh, we looked at the logs a second ago, but if you weren't logging this and you wanted to build a correlation rule in your SIM, uh, and you, wanted to, you didn't know where to start with it, when we come to our detection content, we tell you the Windows policy you'd need to modify in order to generate the right log data. Then you can do make that change, run the test again, okay, well now we've got logs. If you're running Splunk or one of these other vendors up here, we can give you seam specific uh, rule logic. Um, or if you're running another sim, you, it's pretty easy to translate most rules these days from, from a Sigma rule. So you could take this rule and now say, okay, build the search in your sim and we can now detect this behavior. So that sounds really dry and it's only really interesting to people like me that kind of have battled with getting this stuff into sims uh, uh, for, for many years. But where it's really useful for customers, I think, and, and this is where Baz, I think, does a good job of translating the, the techie stuff into the non-techie stuff is that when I, spoke, when, I spoke, when I used to work for a SIM vendor, I worked for service providers, no one wanted to talk to me about logs. It was a very sad time for me. All they wanted to talk to me about was um, attacks. They were, oh, we're worried about this ransomware, we're worried about this thing. So now all of a sudden, I can now say, okay, well, what t attacks are you worried about? I'll simulate them, and then I can get the data out of the tool, and I can go and do my logging stuff, and we can make sure that your SIM is gonna detect the things that you want it to detect. The knock-on effect is this, is that you reduce false positives in your SOC, we all know that socks are really, really scarcely resourced. It's difficult to get hold of people. And to be honest with you, it's a tough job, right? You're chasing down false positives all day. People are moaning at you. People are on your back all the time. So the anything you can do to relieve the pressure from that, I think, is a really good thing. Um, and, that's, and that is exactly what we can do here. Uh, and we can validate it. It works exactly the same way that you want it to work. So the last thing before I hand over to uh, my partner in crime is just on this um, mitigation point, um, so if I just jump back across to checkpoint, uh, I just want just, to just leave you with this. So this is our checkpoint file in this environment. We've delivered 325 uh, payloads to this checkpoint firewall. It's blocked 165. It's not blocked 160. These are all of the action names, all of the, the payloads that have not been blocked. But if we jump across the signatures now, if we load these 154 signatures into our checkpoint firewall, that will take that score from 50 to as close to 100% as Checkpoint can be with the signatures they have in the database. And that's like a really easy, meaningful thing you can do. So you can run this, you can run these templates once a week, or you can run them continuously or once a month, and you can be sure that your controls are reacting in the way that you expect them to react. So, um, so yes, yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll leave it with that and hand over to Dan. Thanks, Simon. Yeah, you've had your... Yeah, that's it. That's it. That's it.